And thank you for coming. We're honored to have with us Dr. John Riley from the University of Colorado today. Dr. Riley received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. It is internal medicine residency training and pulmonary and critical care fellowships at Bergen Women's Hospital before joining the faculty at Harvard. He then joined the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC, where he became the chair of the Department of Medicine and the Jack D. Myers Professor. In 2015, he was appointed Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs and the Dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Colorado. He currently holds the Richard D. Krugman Endowed Chair. Dr. Riley's research interests focus on COP. He was a Parker D. Francis Fellow and has served as the principal investigator and member of the NHL VI National Research Networks. He is a former member and chair of the NHL VI Clinical Trial Study Section and has served as a reviewer for multiple granting organizations and journals. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Riley. Well, uh, good morning, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, speak with you today. So, um, as you heard, I'm a, a pulmonary physician by training. Um, I started my career in the lab, actually start studying macrophage biology with uh, Hal Chapman, who's uh, now on the faculty at UCSF, and then migrated into clinical and uh, translational uh, research. And in my current role, have been sort of thinking about how to position academic medical centers to be successful at uh, clinical research going forward. So I don't have much in the way of conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I aspire to develop a conflict of interest uh, <laughs> that actually has meaningful financial implications, but uh, have not succeeded. Um, so, so there's a few things uh, going on in the world of clinical research today and, and uh, clinical trials, which is uh, the emergence of large trials, large simple trials, um, as we'll talk about in a second, and then uh, the hope that um, with the application of uh, precision medicine techniques, we can actually do uh, smaller trials um, in a more uh, efficient manner. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, uh, the electronic health record and the consent issues and then you know what I think um, uh, we need to do because it's my thesis that a well-run clinical research operation integrated into the delivery of cl uh, clinical care um, will distinguish us from our non-academic uh, competitors in the healthcare landscape. So uh, this is taken from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine and shows uh, in the bottom uh, left-hand corner uh, the traditional randomized clinical trial. You uh, send an army of people out to uh, clinics, um, emergency rooms, inpatient um, settings, depending on what the trial population is, and uh, try to uh, select patients who meet strict entry criteria which usually means they have the condition you're interested in and they don't have a lot else um, so that you don't uh, complicate your trial. Uh, collect a lot of data um, and then um, uh, do your analysis. Uh, at the other end is this emerging thing of trials and health insurance systems which basically uses claims data um, to try to um, address clinical questions. And in between uh, what are now called large simple trials or pragmatic trials, which have uh, broadened entry criteria, uh, are less selective, therefore noisier in terms of um, the characteristics of the population, but arguably more generalizable um, to the way we practice uh, medicine. And uh, this is a checklist um, of how to calculate uh, how pragmatic a uh, trial is. Um, and I think it's our hope that um, doing these trials uh, with the um, uh, electronic uh, informatics background we have in our uh, uh, healthcare systems now will make us more effective at doing um, trials. Um, and that uh, brings uh, me to the concept of um, migrating from a care delivery system to a uh, learning health system, um, uh, which uh, is something that's it's sort of a godmother and apple pie thing. We're always trying to get better, um, but um, uh, tries to codify it in um, a, a way that makes it a part of the culture of a system. And I draw your attention to the middle part of this, chart for our uh, talk uh, today, which is 
a new clinical research paradigm married with clinical decision support systems using the EHR and um, the so-called big data um, tools to try to uh, maximize the knowledge uh, we can develop out of our uh, system. Um, so the next few slides are taken from uh, Brent James, who teaches a course at Process Improvement at Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, he's a surgical oncologist by background and a biostatistician, um, and um, is actually uh, not a big fan of clinical research. Uh, he's a big fan of process improvement, so you'll see that slant on the next three slides. But the internal validity, as, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, can you design a well-controlled trial um, that answers a question that is uh, an intervention um, or a, um, a genetic trait, for instance, associated with the condition of interest or a therapeutic uh, benefit? And, you know, in classic uh, scientific method approach to these things is you try to isolate all the other variables and hold them constant and vary one thing and then look at the effect of that variable on your outcome of uh, interest. So that's internally valid, um, uh, but not necessarily uh, uh, extrapolatable to the general population that we serve, because if your patients are like mine, uh, very few of them have just one thing, um, and no two of them are exactly alike. And then uh, the external uh, validity. And there has been a lot of literature, and it's still, I think, um, uh, in evolution, uh, the relationship between uh, research and uh, uh, process improvement, quality improvement activities uh, within uh, the hospital um, or uh, a healthcare system. Um, uh, this tends to be, uh, the people who do this like to say that they move faster. Um, that, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of good, and if they have good enough data, they'll, they'll move and iterate, um, where in research we want um, uh, very clean data and uh, perfect. Uh, in reality, um, they kind of merge uh, together. And this is the spectrum uh, that we all deal with in the world of clinical uh, research. The classic randomized trial or phase one trials, IRBs, carefully controlled populations uh, uh, aimed at disseminating that informa information to the rest of the medical public. Uh, quality improvement on this end, which doesn't require IRB uh, oversight and is really focused on system uh, performance. Uh, this is a review that I'm sure all of you know uh, between efficacy and effectiveness, again, which gets at the disseminatability of uh, the generalizability of um, uh, information uh, generated uh, versus a, a very clean, um, typically randomized uh, uh, clinical trial. So. Uh, why is that important? So uh, this is now a dated slide because Garrison Keillor doesn't do Lake Wobegon anymore. But one of the things about Lake Wobegon is everybody's above average, right? Um, and in this era of public reporting data, um, nobody wants to be below average, right? Um, and in fact, in, at the University of Utah, when they started putting up faculty patient satisfaction ratings on the web, the faculty that were below average in the Medicare uh, data quickly got nicer. Um, uh, and, um, and nobody wants a doctor or hospital or system that's below average. And if we're going to move to an environment where uh, patients have, quote, more skin in the game, unquote, um, and there's more transparency around pricing, um, people are gonna be making decisions about where to get their care based on the way we make decisions about uh, everything else in our society now, the internet. Um, whether it's uh, Yelp or uh, OpenTable or um, uh, any of the other myriad uh, rating sites, now there's you know, the CMS ratings for every doctor. I know in the state of New York, every cardiac surgeon's data has been on the web for a decade now. Um, so, uh, so we want to perform well. Um, 
one of the things that uh, comes up as we embark on this uh, quest to advance knowledge, which is uh, one of our distinguishing characteristics as an academic enterprise, um, while at the same time providing outstanding care, is uh, what qualifies as the usual provision of care and quality improvement, and what qualifies as research, and do you need IRB approval, and who needs to be uh, consented? I'm not going to answer this question for you. Uh, uh, I'm just going to tell you what the questions are. So um, uh, there's three scenarios on this slide. The first, as you can see here, system is delivering usual care, trying to make people better. Um, people are not doing research. People sign a consent for treatment, which is the standard at, at all healthcare systems across the country. At the other end of the spectrum, um, sorry about that spacing there. Um, uh, people are doing a clinical study in a system and the physician interacting with the patient is one of the investigators in the study. That typically requires, uh, is classified as clinical research, requires IRB oversight, and uh, except in unusual circumstances, uh, requires the consent of the patient. And then the middle ground is um, you're working in a healthcare system, you're providing care to the patient, trying to help them uh, improve their condition, uh, but somebody is studying what you do um, and studying the system. Um, and um, that's the definition of a learning healthcare system. And whether or not you need IRB approval depends on who you ask. Um, and um, in general, the feeling that the old criteria used to be if you were planning on publishing it, you had to go to the IRB and then they could either waive approval or give you an expedited approval. Uh, that distinction doesn't seem to work so well anymore. Um, and um, uh, there's been an active dialogue around this. Uh, I'll give you two cautionary tales about this. Um, uh, this was a, a study um, done in, the, uh, in a series of neonatal ICUs, uh, one of which was at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And uh, at the time the study was done, um, the standard of care for maintaining oxygen saturation in preemies ranged between uh, 85 and 95 percent. Um, and um, they did, uh, these researchers did a study to see if whether maintaining people between 85 and 90 versus 90 and 95, both of which were the usual standard of care, had an impact on the retinopathy of prematurity. Um, which has been associated with oxygen exposure. And in fact, it did. The, the um, uh, infants who were maintained between 85 and 90 had a lower incidence of retinopathy of prematurity. But unexpectedly, at least to these investigators, the uh, kids that were kept between 90 and 95 had a lower mortality. Um, and uh, at the end of this study, uh, some of the parents of the children in the study sued um, the IRB and the investigators for lack of informed um, consent, which was dismissed in a summary judgment, but um, not after a lot of uh, dialogue because the premise of these investigators had been, we're providing usual care. Both groups fell within the realm of what was con constituted usual care. Um, and therefore, randomization uh, did not carry any um, excessive uh, risk. Uh, the next one was uh, this one. So as a pulmonary and critical care person, this was a seminal study uh, in our field. That's when uh, uh, Peter Pronovo and colleagues went to the state of Michigan um, and uh, embarked on what you would, if you were doing this in your hospital, you would call this a process improvement project. So this was a bundle to reduce uh, central bloodstream, uh, central line associated bloodstream infections, so-called CLABSIs. Um, and like all these bundles had four or five components, most of which uh, focused around a sterile technique, putting in and maintaining um, the lines and avoiding using the femoral site for central lines whenever uh, possible. Um, and so they deployed a series of people to go out and educate uh, staff at hospitals and physicians practicing at those hospitals. Um, 
developed report cards for how people were um, following this and had a dramatic reduction in um, uh, central uh, line associated bloodstream infections in the state of Michigan, almost driving them down to zero. Um, and then they got a letter from the um, Office for uh, Human Research Protections, uh, one of uh, our very helpful federal agencies, who basically told them that they um, were um, violating uh, human research guidelines because um, they hadn't gone through every IRB at every hospital in Michigan. They had gone through the Hopkins IRB, the home of the study, who basically said you don't need to go through the IRB because this is um, good care and you're just sort of implementing good care. There's nothing controversial about this. Um, but the OHRP um, uh, position was that uh, all the patients needed to be consented and all the hospitals um, had to ha IRBs had to approve uh, this study. Well, about 40% of the hospitals in Michigan don't have IRBs um, because they don't do, typically don't do um, uh, research uh, at these small community hospitals. And there was an active dialogue for about two years before the OHRP finally um, backed down um, on this position. So it's still a very gray area as to what uh, requires consent or not. And at one point, the OHRP had made this uh, very interesting um, distinction that if you want to do quality improvement and implement all these measures in these hospitals, you can go ahead and do that. But if you want to measure whether they have an impact on patient care, then you have to go to the IRB, um, which uh, is at odds with all of quality improvement, right? Um, and now um, uh, the OHRP, um, I don't think this draft has actually been finalized yet. Last time I looked, which was a couple months ago, even though the draft was in uh, 2014, I don't um, I think it has been finalized. So it's still, as you can see here, taken from the New England Journal uh, a little over two years ago, uh, a lot of enduring questions and uh, challenges, as they put it, which basically means uh, if you read this whole table, it's kind of, well, it depends. Um, you know, it's like when your kids ask you something, are we going to do this? Well, it, it depends. Um, uh, so um, obviously a dialogue with your local IRB about these things, um, and as we'll talk about, uh, sometimes with a central IRB is uh, critical to moving um, these studies forward. So why do we want to do this? Um, one is uh, we want to provide uh, great care, right? And um, we as a country uh, do not universally provide uh, great care. Um, uh, and um, were too expensive, which gets to the middle uh, point on this slide, which is um, uh, we deliver uh, excess care. Uh, I don't think uh, deliberately, but the, the data are uh, pretty clear, and I'll give you two examples of this. Uh, so this is a, uh, a study, um, and we're talking about large trials using insurance database. So this is a Medicare database study, 250,000 people uh, in this uh, trial looks at people who've had um, uh, uh, people um, who had um, uh, stress tests and looks at communities that did relatively small number of stress tests versus communities, areas that did uh, a large number of stress tests per thousand uh, population, divided it into quartiles and looked at outcomes, be, whether stress testing improved the health of the population. And you know, for things that most of us think are important, like death, um, uh, it did not seem to have any systematic relationship with, between improved outcomes and more stress tests. For m preventing myocardial infarction, not uh, any big effect. Uh, getting stents? Big effect, right? Um, going to cabbage, uh, not so much. So are the people in quartile one better served than the people in quartile four or vice versa? Um, we spent 
uh, a lot more money on these people, right? Um, and if you look at the uh, Dartmouth Atlas uh, data about the, the variation of healthcare expenditures across the U.S., um, this is probably the only time New York is a red state. Um, uh, as is my former hometown in uh, Massachusetts, Colorado, we're pink, uh, so uh, a little better. Um, uh, you know, the, these numbers would be higher now um, because this data are about 10 years old, but the pattern wouldn't look much different. Um, if you overlay any kind of health outcome data on this map, there is no, um, uh, no clear association between these expenditure patterns and health outcomes. So when you hear the 30% of healthcare expenditures in the US are excess care or waste, it is uh, based on the difference between costs in these areas and costs in these areas. Um, uh, and saying, given that there's no difference in health outcomes, if, you, if these areas just spent what these areas spend, you could reduce Medicare expenditures by 30%. Now, the other reason that I think about in my new role as a dean is uh, incredibly self-serving. Um, but I would argue um, it's an attitude that all of you should have as well, which is uh, self-interest. Um, so, in general, um, academic medical centers are growing. Um, we're a state institution in Colorado, and I'll show you our state funding in a moment, but um, our state funding is not growing. Um, uh, there's lots of pressures on uh, government uh, reimbursement now. You've all been following the uh, back and forth about Medicaid in um, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, there's been lots of talk about how the NIH has been uh, in absolute dollars um, relatively flat since the doubling under the second George Bush. Um, and in real, in real dollars, actually, in terms of purchasing power, declining. Um, the uh, draconian uh, proposal coming out of the White House Budget Office doesn't seem to have um, any legs. But um, it'll be a I think the proposals are about a billion dollars more in the budget next year, which is a couple of percent, um, you know, from 3% or so. So the NIH is pretty flat. So what supports the academic mission? And at most places now, it's uh, the clinical uh, revenue stream um, that uh, supports the academic mission. I don't know what they call it here. At, at our place, we call it the Academic Enrichment Fund, but everybody on my campus calls it the Dean's Tax. Um, uh, and you can see what's happened um, uh, to uh, academic medical centers and medical schools over um, the last uh, 55 years. The US population up about 75%. Number of physicians up substantially more than that number of full-time uh, basic science faculty up more than that, number of full-time clinical faculty at uh, medical schools in the U.S. up um, dramatically. Um, and so in our uh, region, what that looks like is this for us. So uh, this is where we get our money at the University of Colorado from the 80s up until uh, uh, last year. This red line down here is uh, my state support. So when I have faculty who come to me and say, I want hard money to support my salary, that's the hard money. So we are, um, uh, we are a soft money enterprise, and almost every place in the United States now is a soft money um, uh, enterprise. Um, and this blue, which is a, our practice plan, is the engine that's allowing us to invest in research and education. So if that is going to be the case going forward, and I think it's likely the case, then you want to be the most successful clinical enterprise around, and you want to be the destination of choice for patients in your community. Now, admittedly, our community is a lot smaller than your community, so there's probably room for more than one of you here, but um, uh, we're the only academic show in town in our state, um, uh, and for about 600 miles around. Um, so, 
the other thing is this notion of developing more precise, smaller uh, clinical trials that will have larger effect sizes that you can do with smaller uh, patient populations. Um, and classically, uh, that's involved trying to pick uh, the population that you think is uh, most likely to benefit from um, uh, an intervention. And um, here's uh, one schematic of such a th uh, thing. This is an adaptive clinical trial now. Um, it's an interesting thing. So the FDA for clinical trials now, if you have, we'll use the example of cancer. If you have a pathway-specific drug that you want to use in cancer, the FDA requires uh, you to also try it in patients who don't have a mutation in that pathway, um, who uh, you would predict are not going to respond. And therefore, if you add those non-responses uh, in, uh, will minim you know, reduce your uh, therapeutic benefit from your pathway-specific drug. So this adaptive trial design takes an interim analysis, and if a group is um, not responding, stops that group and continues on with um, the group that is responding. This requires that you define these up front. Um, so the trial design um, is important, uh, as are um, uh, the rules. But this is... Um, an approach both because of FDA reasons and uh, because of the um, new targets in oncology that's um, gaining a lot of traction in the world of oncology clinical trials. Uh, the other approach is this, um, I don't know how many times uh, I've sat um, in meetings with investigators and they said, you know, the intervention is working but the P is in 0.05, we just need to get more patients and then the biostatisticians cringe and um, pull their hair out and say, you can't do that, that's not the appropriate way to do a trial. Well, this is the way you can do that. Um, uh, that uh, before you start the trial, um, you um, uh, look at uh, an effect size that you're predicting and then take an interim look and say, uh, are we seeing a benefit or not? And if it's in the unfavorable zone, you keep going. If it's in the promising zone, um, you uh, increase your adopted, your uh, maximal sample size. So you see here it goes up by about 60 percent, 50 percent, from 11,000 to 16,000. Uh, and if it's in the favorable zone, you, you keep your original sample size. And what that looks like is uh, this. Um, and uh, this means the likelihood of doing a big trial um, and coming out with an inconclusive answer is reduced, but at the expense of having to do a really big trial in certain um, uh, circumstances. But it is a way that you can uh, increase the number um, of uh, participants without um, uh, sacrificing statistical power. And the challenge we all face, particularly in these large, uh, simple trials, is we have a heterogeneous population. Um, and uh, I developed this slide for talking about um, COPD studies, because it's, it's my belief that COPD is, um, is an umbrella term, and there are lots of um, endotypes within uh, COPD. And so if you uh, put an intervention in, some people get better, some people might get worse, some people get a little bit better, some people might get a little bit worse. And in the end, the mean doesn't move uh, very much. Um, and this has certainly been true in the world of COPD. The ideal thing would be to just study the people who get better, right? If you can figure out who those are. Um, and if, they re if the, you really refine your population, big magnitude of benefit, relatively few participants. Um, and so this kind of depends on uh, where you want to do your work. If you really have a good sense of what a refined population looks like and you're willing to screen a lot of people to get that refined population, um, then um, you can do this. And I think everybody believes now that, um, uh, or hopes, 
that we can use the electronic health record to do this without having to hire 53 research coordinators to uh, go through and screen uh, thousands of participants. In the world of COPD, uh, a big um, uh, outcome right now is to look at COPD exacerbations. Um, and if you look at how to do a trial on COPD exacerbations, uh, you would um, use this kind of paradigm. So here are people, year one, no exacerbations, one, two, or more. And if you follow these, the people who had no exacerbations in year one were pretty likely to have no exacerbations in year two and pretty likely to have no exacerbations in year three. Which means if you're trying to reduce exacerbations and you're looking for a signal of exacerbation reduction, you don't want these people in your trial. Conversely, if you look at people who had two or more, year two, they're pretty likely to have two or more. And year three, they're pretty likely to have two or more. So if you're trying to impact COPD exacerbations, this is the group that you want. Um, how do you figure out who this group is? You take a history. Um, <laughs> So uh, that's uh, precision medicine in the world of uh, COPD. Um, so, uh, but there is this hope that with the advent of uh, electronic health records and um, the computational horsepower to um, uh, combine all that data with other data sets, um, uh, with the appropriate uh, statistical tools and techniques because the two-sided uh, t-test with a p less than 0.05 does not work for these um, uh, large data sets that you can um, uh, come up with um, uh, better approaches to identifying these populations. And another trend in the markets that's contributing to this is uh, most healthcare systems and uh, my conversations with Dr. Charney would suggest that yours is no exception, are getting bigger. Um, systems are um, consolidating, which means if you're all on the same platform, you've got a lot of patients in your database, more than you're just seeing at your hospital, but you have the whole system. Um, and the hope is you can take that electronic uh, data and develop uh, reliable phenotypes um, that you can then correlate with whatever you're interested in, whether it's uh, genotypes, epigenetics, proteomics, expression profiling, um, you name it. Um, and um, without having to um, manually review thousands and thousands of um, uh, records. Because we are in an era now um, where the economic paradigm has shifted. So when I started my career, um, the expensive thing was the genotyping. You know, you could put together a population of patients and you had enough money in your grant that you could like pick three SNPs um, and look at them. And, that, and you burned all your budget on uh, the genotyping. Uh, the genotyping is cheap now, right? I mean, we, uh, um, we're using an Omni uh, mega chip, which has 200,000 SNPs with uh, good coverage, and we're paying $52 a chip um, uh, to do that. So what's expensive now is finding the cases, is uh, accurate phenotyping. That, that's where the time, effort, and expense is. And here is uh, the uh, NIH working group um, approach to developing um, good uh, phenotypes out of the electronic health record. Um, and what you'll see in here is uh, what you see in every company that is um, in this space now, trying to develop phenotypes out of the electronic health record, um, which is at some point you have to have somebody who knows something about medicine look at the charts. Um, so if you look at Flatiron out in Colorado that's doing it, um, there's chart review. If you look at uh, Tempest, the company in Chicago that's focused on cancer. They use natural language processing on, on the electronic health record, but then they take that output and give it to Moonlighting Oncology Fellows to um, uh, review and um, edit. Um, and um, I think there is a belief by many people that they can um, get the people out of this um, loop. And we'll talk about where that's at. 
This remains, I think, uh, the biggest stumbling block. I, as uh, you heard in the introduction, uh, I spent um, uh, some time at the University of Pittsburgh as the chairman of the Department of Medicine there. And um, while we were there, we created this big enterprise data warehouse to pull in data from the, all the systems that were in our hospital system. And we ran a simple query um, and tried to divide people by sex. And uh, it turns out that there were 52 different ways to uh, designate what somebody's sex were in all the different databases at um, UPMC. So the things that seem conceptually simple are uh, implementationally um, uh, difficult. Um, the other limitation we have, depending on, you know, particularly if you're in health services research, is by and large, unless you're in a system that has an insurance company, um, uh, or you're in partnership with an insurance company that's willing to share data with you, you have the data for what you do, but you don't have the data for what everybody else does to those patients. Um, uh, and um, uh, getting that data is hard. Any of you who've done any work with Medicare databases after you've paid them your $10,000 um, realize that that data is typically sort of 18 months old, which um, uh, limits its uh, utility. And here's the problem, I think, with phenotyping from, uh, from electronic health records is uh, most of us don't write our clinic notes or progress notes with the idea that we're involved in a clinical research study. Um, and you're working in a system that was designed to optimize reimbursement and billing, not designed to optimize uh, patient care. Um, this is the subject of a lot of um, attention from um, uh, the NIH and others. And um, a lot of people have proposed that there are a couple solutions uh, to this. So. Uh, for you, uh, BBC, uh, your uh, PBS fans, this is Watson. Um, this is Google DeepMind. If you go out and talk to Andy Conrad at Google um, Life Sciences, now called Verily, um, uh, he believes in this like we believe in religion. Um, that applying these uh, unbiased uh, techniques which have no uh, preconceptions, no hypotheses, no um, uh, content discipline specific knowledge, but just applying these uh, neural network tools to um, data sets like the electronic health record that uh, they can pull meaningful uh, patterns out of the data. Um, and um, DeepMind has actually um, put in place uh, an uh, intervention um, uh, to uh, look at uh, patients with acute kidney injury uh, in the UK, um, which um, uh, bypasses the basically the doctor on the floor and goes straight to the nephrologist uh, for um, values that um, reach a certain uh, threshold or um, have a, a certain uh, interval change um, since uh, the last one. Uh, the problem with all these things is um, uh, a couple. One is the quality of the data in the, uh, in the text notes of the electronic health record. The other is, um, uh, I, I gave this example at the talk I gave the other day. Um, there, these techniques have been very useful in um, pattern recognition. Um, so uh, there's uh, very good data that they're very good at diagnosing uh, and classifying diabetic uh, retinopathy uh, based on uh, retinal camera images. Uh, there's very good data that there is good or better than dermatologists at classifying skin lesions as melanoma um, and based on a learning set that was done of a, a visual atlas of melanomas that were submitted by dermatologists all over the country. Um, but they had to go back and um, correct the algorithm um, that was doing the melanoma work because part of the thing about submitting your images to this dermatology atlas is you had to take a yellow sticker, a little yellow dot, and put it next to the melanoma before you took the picture of it. And the first iteration of the data analysis from these machine learning methods was if you had a yellow dot on your skin, you had melanoma. Um, uh, so um, uh, it does need um, 
there are some caveats in applying it. Um, and so far, if you look at what it's developed out of the text parts of the electronic health record, uh, it's been a bit um, disappointing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, even if you confine it to an area like oncology, you still wind up, ha wind up having to do human review of the output of these natural language processing programs. But if you look at image analysis, um, it's um, uh, really making um, an impact. Um, and um, this is medical grand round, so I don't know if there are any radiologists here, but if I were, you know, uh, 24 years old again and graduating from medical school, I would not be going into diagnostic radiology. Um, um, uh, and I'll show you a couple examples. Uh, I know you guys had George Washko here um, a few months back, pul a pulmonary guy who does image analysis applied to uh, chest CT scans. Um, and his group has actually uh, applied one of these uh, convolutional neural networks to uh, chest CT scans. Now, these, this is a very computationally intensive technique. So, you know, a typical high resolution volumetric chest CT scan now can have up to 100, uh, have, have up to about 500 slices in it. This uses four um, uh, from that uh, data set. Um, runs it through the neural network and reduces it to this uh, one dimension uh, data set um, marching through this progression and so that's what the computer quote sees. And if you look at it and say can you look at those patterns and classify people and for clinically meaningful things this is the receiver operating curve for whether or not they have COPD without knowing anything else about the patients. Um, not perfect, but pretty good. Um, this is if you assign a risk of somebody having COPD and compare it to um, the COPD, this is COPD gene data, a 10,000 subject uh, observational study um, in uh, COPD. The correlation uh, is pretty good with the totality of the clinical data. If you look at predicting mortality, they're actually pretty good at discriminating, particularly the high risk subjects from uh, everybody else. Totally agnostic to any clinical information whatsoever, just based on the uh, images. Um, the interesting thing about this, I think, is if you go back to this, it doesn't actually need the pictures. It just needs the data stream coming out of the CT scanner to, to go through this um, exercise. So we are not far from the day, I don't think, when what comes out of the CT scanner will be both the patient and the report at the same time. And the only reason there'll be images is because we like to look at pictures. Um, but they're not, the computer is not, doesn't need the pictures to um, generate the data. So, um, so as I've been thinking about this, um, uh, I think we need to get to a point where the oncologists already are. So in the world of oncology, um, the nationally recognized centers are in part nationally recognized because they offer patients access to clinical trials. And patients will travel to participate in um, clinical trials. Um, for those of you who um, do clinical trials in non-neoplastic disease, um, your experience is uh, probably like mine, that the rate limiting factor for every uh, clinical trial is uh, subject recruitment. Um, uh, we're always, uh, it's sort of like, you know, your home renovation contractor. We're wildly optimistic about timeline and cost when we put in the grant proposal. Um, and then um, when, uh, push comes to shove, it's uh, slow. And I think we need to position our sy systems and educate the patient population that they want to come to us because we do clinical research. And that being involved in clinical research is a good thing. Um, you're not being a, uh, a guinea pig. Um, the regulatory oversight and consent issues are an issue and you have to work with your IRB. Um, uh, 
as we talked about, extracting phenotypes from the electronic health record is a challenge, and I think it will continue to be a challenge. The areas where um, I've seen it work best are areas where a group of clinicians usually focus on a particular disease. So in Pittsburgh, it was the inflammatory bowel disease group, got together and said, at every visit, we're going to collect this set of data on every patient, and did that, and after a few years, had a very useful, well-characterized uh, longitudinal um, database. But just relying on um, uh, what doctors put in the record is um, uh, uh, not going to generate the pre precise phenotypes that we need. And I think this can be our competitive advantage. Um, we can do well by um, doing good. Now, what, uh, what will it take to be successful? Um, one is, uh, I think, uh, data. So uh, typically, Historically, um, across the academic medical landscape, we've had a lot of re patient registries, but they've typically been focused on a particular disease. You know, people have an asthma registry or a prostate cancer registry or um, other things, sometimes associated with blood samples and tissue, other times um, with the ability to recontact patients and consent them uh, for trials. Um, but um, uh, we need to have registries that incorporate the entire population. I know you guys are starting one here. Uh, we have one in Colorado that has about um, 50,000 adults in it, and we're adding a couple thousand a month. Um, uh, we haven't tackled the issue of how you get kids into those registries and how you handle the transition to adulthood, but that's clearly the next um, uh, step. Um, I think the omics that needs the most the um, uh, development is the phenomics, um, accurately uh, characterizing patients to keep pace with what's going on in proteomics, epigenomics, genomics, uh, et cetera. Um, I think one of the issues that we're all going to confront as we start doing this precision medicine kind of thing, particularly when you start genotyping patients, is uh, what's research and what's clinical and what goes back to the patient and how do you disclose that information to them. Uh, not um, uh, straightforward things because if you um, if you're interested in my world COPD and you genotype somebody broadly because that's what the chips or sequencing does and it turns out they have a BRCA mutation you probably need to let them know about that but then you need to have somebody who other than a pulmonologist explain to them um, what it means to have a, a, a BRCA mutation so there's a lot of ethics and um, uh, uh, consent issues that uh, are involved. Uh, the other thing is um, I think we need to start cooperating with each other. Um, so this is my play well on the sandbox slide. Um, uh, if you look at the CTSAs, you know, we just competitively renewed uh, our CTSA. Um, they're actually now getting serious about making this different CT CTSAs uh, form meaningful uh, research networks. Uh, before, we all wrote in applications that we would form research networks with our five best friends. Um, but if you actually looked at the research output, it, uh, there wasn't a lot of it. Um, but now they're mandating it. And one of the um, uh, ways they do that is uh, to go to uh, renew your CTSA now, you have to agree to participate in clinical trials using a single IRB. Um, and when I was in Boston, when I was in Pittsburgh, that was like the third rail. Our IRBs were like, yeah, you can use a single IRB as long as it's us. Um, um, and it took us 24 months to work that out in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the notion of academic research organizations being as efficient and being able to compete with uh, commercial clinical research organizations, I think, will be uh, key to our success going forward. Uh, there's some examples of this in PCORI. Um, uh, people have uh, done some uh, pilots of six or eight um, uh, healthcare systems working together to develop, to develop registries around specific diseases. Uh, asthma and obesity are uh, two of them. I um, think at the end of the day, what distinguishes us is uh, what the human resource people like to call human capital. 
um, uh, continuing to attract um, uh, talent. And I don't, don't think the place for the observant clinician has gone away. And in fact, I think it's now uh, more ascendant um, than ever um, uh, because the phenotyping is, um, uh, I think, where um, the uh, challenges are. Um, and as I said, if we can integrate this in a way that's non-intrusive to taking care of patients um, and, um, but allows us to advance knowledge at the same time, then um, I think we'll distinguish ourselves from uh, uh, non-academic systems and it will actually give us a market advantage in terms of uh, attracting patients. And with that, let me close and uh, thank you for your attention. Congratulations on Thanks. taking on such a uh, challenge, the uh, inadequacy of some of our research in healthcare. I have a question for you about age and aging, which you didn't seem to mention. Uh, age and aging, I mean to say the aging of the full being or the aging of the cell are two different processes, but they seem to control most of the big illnesses, those factors, cardiovascular, uh, oncology and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we do to bring age and aging into American medical research? Well, I think it's um, there. I think it is a, it's a fair observation that if you look at uh, some of the classic clinical trials, they put, um, uh, they um, uh, constrict or um, uh, restrict um, uh, participation by subjects of, uh, above a certain age. Um, and um, the associations of aging with atherosclerotic disease, with cancer, and some of these other conditions, um, I think raises the question of how much of it is an association, how much of it is causality and underlying mechanisms. Um, uh, there, you know, there are competing stimuli, so the notion that chronic inflammation contributes to those conditions as well, and now these new trials looking at anti-inflammatory therapy. But it is a fair um, uh, observation that the very young and the very old are underrepresented in our uh, clinical research spectrum, um, and um, that that needs to be corrected. And if you look at the demographics of the U.S., um, that that um, whatever you uh, draw your line at, and like most people, my line is moving up as I approach it. Um, uh, wherever you draw that line, uh, that population is gonna grow considerably over the next uh, two decades uh, in both absolute numbers and as a proportion uh, uh, of our society. So that um, people need to bring um, uh, an interest in that to bear and that, you know, clinical research in a, in a healthcare system is actually an ideal place to do that because if you look at who consumes care in our academic medical centers, it is skewed towards um, younger people with chronic disease and the older population. Um, so the opportunity is there. Um, uh, people have to take advantage of it. And I think there's more recognition by trial sponsors that restricting, um, putting a top limit on the age is not necessarily in people's best interest. Any other questions? Please. Um, yes, uh, you brought up a good point about sort of integrating our ability to do clinical trials into the clinical setting, and it's challenging to do that for, for clinicians. Can you talk a little bit about at your institution about contact policies? Because we have great access to EMRs where we can either directly through our EMR or using natural language processing software could identify patients who are eligible for clinical trials, but it's no help if you're not permitted to reach out and contact the patients. Is there uh, work that's being done in your institution to really maximize our ability to do that? Yeah, this issue of um, um, under what circumstances uh, without uh, actively engaging the treating clinician or making the treating clinician um, the uh, portal of communication, because um, we should actively engage the treating clinicians. But um, uh, 
uh, is um, a complicated one, and it depends on how you set up your registry. So if you look at Vanderbilt, for instance, which probably has the biggest registry and the biggest biobank of DNA from a, a general uh, patient population, because I think they're 200,000 plus, um, you know, they de-identify that data going in, and you can't recontact those patients. So if they develop um, an insight from that um, resource, that has clinical care implications, you actually have to go back and genotype patients again to see whether they're eligible for that uh, intervention. Uh, we looked at that um, uh, in Colorado and actually structured a consent which required some dialogue with our um, IRB, uh, and they were um, good about that, but structured a consent that allows us to um, uh, recontact patients um, and allows us to keep patients identified in the genotyping uh, biobank. Um, uh, and we will be moving uh, as our pilot project pharmacogenomic data back into the electronic health record um, uh, uh, because we uh, went through the CLIA certification process for our genotyping. So we can contact um, uh, patients. Um, uh, you know, uh, Steve Reese, who runs the CTSA in Pittsburgh, and I um, have had an active uh, conversation about this because um, uh, we need a traffic cop, I think. Uh, we don't want to become the telemarketers of the 2020s, right? Where it's like, oh my God, Mount Sinai is calling again because because uh, we have patients with multiple chronic diseases, right? So, you know, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, mild uh, renal insufficiency, and you don't want to be ha letting the nephrologist, the cardiologist, the general intern, all, the, all these people doing five different studies descending on um, one patient. And the best way to organize that is not clear. What they do in Pittsburgh is they once a quarter mail patients uh, a letter or email and say, here are four studies based on your health record and your interest that um, you might be interested in if you're interested in contact these people. Um, so there are a variety of approaches, but I think in this day and age, you need to, I personally believe you're better served by structuring your consent that you can keep the genetic data identified, and you have uh, the ability with appropriate uh, oversight to contact patients directly without making their treating physicians be the ones who have to contact them. Let's thank Dr. Ronnie okay. for his visit today.